The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Almost one and a half million Canadians who contracted COVID face lingering symptoms, sometimes debilitating ones. But even years into this pandemic, what so-called long COVID entails, and whether that's even a helpful label for it, remains puzzling. We'll look for some answers tonight. Then, former hockey star Justin Davis once played for the best junior hockey team in Canada, the best university team in Canada, and the best senior men's team in Canada. Tonight, we'll talk about his new memoir, which explains what made him eventually hate the sport and its culture. It's Tuesday, February 28th, and that's ahead on The Agenda. According to Statistics Canada, about 15% of all those who contracted COVID-19 experienced lingering symptoms three plus months and longer after the initial infection. Ontario just introduced a new diagnostic code for long COVID, as it's often known. But as more research emerges from here and around the world, the appropriateness of that term and diagnosis has come into question. Some ask if it does more to obscure than clarify what's going on. With us now for more, in Brooklyn, New York, Dr. Jennifer Frontera, professor of neurology at New York University's Langone Grossman School of Medicine and a member of the World Health Organization Brain Health Neurology and COVID-19 Forum. In our nation's capital, Raywat Dan Anden, epidemiologist and professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Ottawa, and here in our studio, former scientific director of Ontario's COVID-19 science advisory table, Dr. Fahad Razak, who is an internist at St. Michael's Hospital and associate professor at the University of Toronto. And Dr. Razak, we're delighted to have you back here in our studio. Uh, professor Frontera, Dr. Raywat Dan Anden in Ottawa, great to have you two on our program as well. Let me start with just some stats here to get us started here. According to the WHO, the World Health Organization, around 10 to 20 percent of people infected with COVID-19 may go on to develop symptoms that can be diagnosed as, you've heard this term, long COVID. And a StatsCan survey from this fall suggests some 1.4 million Canadian adults experienced symptoms three months after a COVID infection. 1.4 million adults. That's a lot. Okay, Rewa, get us into this here. Many of those 1.4 million have, of course, since recovered from those symptoms, but many undoubtedly have not. How should we understand the impact long COVID is continuing to have today? Wow, that's a big question. Uh, there is a study by an economist out of Harvard that suggests that the economic impact of long COVID on the U.S. system is worth $2.6 trillion, 17% oh. of their GDP. And consider that the actual uh, health output is like 18% of GDP. This is staggering. Um, I don't know what the impact will be in Canada, but it will be of uh, you know, a similar scale. So this is not something to be taken lightly. This could be something that plagues us no pun intended, for years and decades to come unless we get a handle on it soon. And that handle will look something like diagnostics, therapies, and preventatives. Jennifer Frontera, can I get you to weigh in on that as well? Yeah, I would agree. Um, back in August, the Brookings Institute put out a uh, estimate that there's about 170 to $230 billion in lost wages amongst uh, working age Americans who are unable to go back to their normal profession uh, because of long COVID symptoms. And uh, we looked at this in a cohort of post-hospitalized New York patients. And uh, even 12 months later, 50% of them were unable to go back to their normal level of uh, work responsibility. So uh, absolutely, there's a significant impact. My goodness, the, uh, Dr. Razak, those numbers are absolutely shocking and staggering. So it obviously behooves you professionals to figure this out at some point. Do you, what have you heard about whether or not it's different in the United States from Canada? Yeah, so the numbers from the United States seem to be probably higher than they are in Canada. And one of the theories behind that is when did the majority of infections occur? So in Canada, uh, as you know, we had relatively tight constraints on public health measures early in the course of the pandemic, especially before we had vaccines. And it seems to be that if you were infected before you had some immune protection, your chance of developing long COVID went up. Hmm. So 
early in the pandemic, over those first two years, the United States had more than double the rates of infections that we did. And the prevalence now of long COVID there, based on their national surveys versus our national surveys, is roughly double. So it could potentially explain some of the differences that we're seeing. And it does reinforce why prevention becomes very important when we talk about long COVID. If you can't, if you can't develop long COVID, if you don't get infected in the first place. Uh, I don't want to overly simplify this, but does that suggest that our approach was better than their approach? I think it's worthwhile now, three years out, to ask the question. And I would say that our approach was one of the strictest among G10 nations, for example. But we also had among the lowest infection rates. We had the, among the lowest death rates. Um, our research group, for example, did an analysis in the Canadian Medical Association Journal that showed that if we followed countries like the United States or France, we would have had 9 million more infections in Canada in those first two years. 9 million in a population of 38 million, that's a huge number. We would have had, for example, 70,000 more deaths in those first two years of Canadians. So there are very big differences now emerging because of the different policies that were taken. Jennifer, again, I'm going to ask you to weigh in on the differences between how Canada and the United States uh, approach this issue. Yeah, I mean, uh, New York is a leader in many things, including the first to have all different kinds of infections and variants, because it is, um, you know, a big city and a, a real a crossroads of the world. So, <clears throat> though we had a little bit of forewarning, certainly um, we were not at, you know, prepared for the extent of what we faced back in, you know, March of 2020. Um, I think uh, it was a wake-up call probably for other places, including Canada, of what you don't want to do. Um, and uh, we were really practicing disaster medicine. It's it's uh, something I hope to never have to do again. Um, I'm a neurointensivist, so I was in the ICU uh, during that time frame and um, saw how sick uh, these patients were. Uh, you know, I don't want to assume everybody knows what long COVID is. I suspect we all know people who've got it. But let's just get some appropriate definitions on the record here before we continue any further. And uh, again, I'll ask our director, Sheldon Osman, to bring this graphic up because the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention defines long COVID as having, quote, a wide range of symptoms that can last more than four weeks or even months after infection. The Government of Canada website echoes the WHO's guidelines and defines it as experiencing, quote, physical or psychological symptoms more than 12 weeks after getting COVID-19. And here's a quote from Zainab Tufeci, uh, who is a sociologist, occasionally writes in the New York Times, who says the following, current definitions are so broad and imprecise that they impede understanding. Under the CDC definition, someone with a single symptom just four weeks after illness can be lumped under the long COVID umbrella with someone bedbound for years. Existing definitions fail to capture the subcategories of long COVID, with different symptom clusters and levels of severity and persistence, creating an obstacle to research and treatments. Okay, Rewa, can I get you to... Um, your, your view of that conundrum that she's identified there in that column? Yeah, she's not wrong. A broad definition conceals a host of woes. It might be useful to subdivide long COVID into a variety of phases. An integrative model has been proposed, for example, an acute phase, a long phase, a persistent phase. Um, it also conceals the mechanisms. What are the underlying mechanisms here? There's a mechanism having to do with lingering viral presence, a mechanism having to do with tissue damage caused by infection, a mechanism having to do with the inflammation caused by infection itself. And all these things are, again, concealed by this very broad definition. And clinicians tend to approach the treatment of long COVID to the extent that they are approaching it syndromically, meaning by clusters of symptoms. And again, this broad definition uh, doesn't allow for the nuanced approach required to, to dissect that approach. So I think a lot of work has to be done to subdivide definitions better to better serve the clientele that will emerge as this crisis unfolds. Jennifer, do you think the definition currently under use is too broad? Yeah, I mean, I think it was a pragmatic solution when there's no biological markers for what people are experiencing. And certainly um, the umbrella of long COVID is very heterogeneous. Um, and, you know, we looked at this in our population and others have also to look for clusters or how do these people group together. Um, it seems like, you know, there's a, a group of folks that have primarily pulmonary issues, 
uh, group of folks that have primarily neurologic issues, headache, brain fog, et cetera. And then there's a smaller subset of people, at least in our experience, about 15% that had a lot of symptoms, a median of like 17 different symptoms, um, with uh, prominent anxiety, depression, and other um, mood disorder type symptoms. And uh, you can actually cluster these people in terms of how they respond to therapies as well. Um, the good news is that the people that do have a lot of symptoms um, report a very good response rate when their uh, treatment strategy includes approaches to um, anxiety, depression, and other um, uh, mood disorders. I, I think this just speaks to the fact that we have to have a holistic approach to these folks um, and not just treat one symptom at a time, but look at the whole con context of what these people are dealing with uh, when they come into our post-COVID clinics. All right, let me follow up on that with you, Fahad, in as much as, can I use this analogy here? We don't really talk about cancer anymore. We talk about, you know, liver cancer, brain cancer, lung cancer. Should we be looking at long COVID in the same way? We need to define it more specifically. I, I think that's exactly right. And I would say as a clinician who sees patients with long COVID in clinic or in the hospital, our response in medicine a lot of times when we don't understand something clinically, we don't like treating it because we don't understand what's causing it. We don't understand the spectrum of what can present in front of us. And I think long COVID presents us with that kind of problem. It's hard to treat something when you don't even know how to diagnose it properly. And so when you talk about cancer, you don't just treat cancer. You treat a prostate cancer, you treat a breast cancer. And I think long COVID is, is like that in many ways. You have to think about the symptoms that people are presenting with, try and address those symptoms, even yet as we don't understand that underlying cause. And, you know, I think the symptoms can be very, very severe and very hard to treat. And especially in Canada with our constrained healthcare system, this is not an easy blood test. It's not a heart attack where you send someone for an ECG and a blood test and you've made your diagnosis. It is meticulous information gathering. It takes a lot of time. There's a real human interaction element, but we're dealing with a system where in Canada, 5 million people don't have access to regular primary care. Mm. So who is going to do that meticulous data gathering to get to the diagnosis? It's a real challenge. That's a great question. You got an answer for that? Well, you're seeing that investment now come in. And I think the investment that comes in federally and provincially, for me, the belief is that primary care is the backbone of a well-functioning healthcare system, not just because of long COVID, but long COVID is gonna be one of the major draws on the system. If you speak to family doctors now, when patients come in with long COVID, the typical appointment time may be 10 or 15 minutes for a patient. For a long COVID patient first presenting, that's crazy. You can't get to any part of the history in 10 or 15 minutes. And so our need to reset the system in terms of capacity, the ability to dedicate more time to these assessments, that's part of why this investment is needed now. I think Dr. Danielle Martin just fell in love with you. <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> what she would say. friend and colleague, yeah. <laughs> if she were here, she'd say the exact yeah. same thing. Uh, Ray Watt, the analogy of cancer, do you think it works in this case? It, it does, but I prefer the analogy of tobacco. So smokers have a variety of bad outcomes, diabetes, emphysema, lung cancer, cosmetic staining on their teeth. If we were to just approach the symptoms for the cosmetic staining, you see a dentist, for the emphysema, you see a lung specialist, for the uh, diabetes, you see an endocrinologist, and each of those cases would possibly miss the underlying cause, which is smoking. So I think ultimately we're going to need long COVID clinics in major urban centers that can integrate a variety of specialties to approach these conditions from an interdisciplinary perspective. And I would, I would echo what Dr. Rezak just said about the family doctors struggling with this. What we also need is billing codes, specific billing codes in Ontario for family doctors to, uh, to be able to apply them and, and have more time with these individuals who present to them. And those additional billing codes in partnership with the new diagnostic codes will allow us to have a better surveillance on the ground as this nightmare unfolds. Can, let me follow up with you on that. We've seen the beginnings of an understanding by the Ontario Health Insurance Plan for billing codes for long COVID. But if I hear you right, you think we're only at the beginning and we need something a lot more detailed. Is that fair? I, I think so. I think what a family doctor would tell you is that the nightmare is a diagnosis without a treatment. And we hmm. want to make sure that we are linking diagnoses with appropriate treatments, uh, pathways to see the appropriate specialists and so forth, um, but also assuring that there is sufficient time to see an individual patient, as Dr. Razak suggested, and a billing code would uh, allow some of that. I think the billing codes for um, chronic fatigue are appropriate in this case. We can use that model. Okay, Dr. Frontera, let me try this with you in, in as much as, let's look at research and treatment. If, if the whole world right now sort of looks at long COVID as opposed to, in using the cancer analogy, 
Let me take a step back. I'm guessing that when you, people want to do research projects, medical personnel want to do research projects, they are, they are doing research on brain cancer. They are doing research on prostate cancer. They're not just doing it on cancer willy-nilly. It's got to be more specific. Does, does, does referring to this as long COVID impede your efforts to actually make progress on that front? Yeah, in some ways it, it certainly does, because if you're not designing a research study appropriately with an outcome that is uh, could be affected mechanistically by whatever your treatment choice is, you risk having a study either with spurious uh, results or a study that's not appropriately powered to show an effect of the treatment modality. So generally speaking, you know, you would have to really focus on, uh, I'm going to look at post-COVID cognitive disorders or post-COVID headache or uh, post-COVID um, exertional dyspnea, something to, to that effect. You really have to, to, to narrow down the scope of what you're looking at. I need um, a translation there. Hang on a sec. I need a translation. You used an expression there that I'm sorry, I haven't heard before. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, shortness of breath, you know. Uh, oh, there we um, go. Yeah, if you, uh, if you look at, um, you know, patients that have post-COVID shortness of breath and you say, well, I'm going to lump them with people that have brain fog and I'm going to study this treatment specific to brain fog. Well, you're, you're not likely to see any effect on the people that don't even have that symptom to begin with. And so uh, you're going to underpower your study, meaning you won't enroll enough people to see the effect that you need to see statistically. So, you know, there is a risk in, in that regard. There's very few treatments that are going to um, uh, address all COVID symptoms. One of them is vaccination, however. So there is data showing that if you're vaccinated, you're less likely to have long COVID uh, across a broad spectrum of different symptoms. Um, people are interested in Paxlovid in regards to uh, ameliorating possible viral reservoirs, which might be a unifying mechanism for a variety of different symptoms. Uh, we're not close enough to say that that's uh, going to work. Um, so. I think in the interim, we have to very carefully define the populations that we want to study. Let me pick up on that with you, Fahad. Is it likely that there is a single upstream cause that you can target that will help alleviate all the different downstream symptoms that you see? Yeah, I, I think there is a single upstream cause, and that is the infection. So this is where prevention becomes critical. So if you don't get infected, you can't develop long COVID. Once you get infected, then the mechanisms start to spread. So for some people, it can be abnormal clotting. For some people, it could be your immune system ramps up and you develop an autoimmune process where it starts to attack your body. For other people, it's scarring of the organs. For other people, it's continued inflammation. So once the initial insult happens, that infection that triggers all of these abnormalities to begin, then you see this spread happen across different processes. Mm -hmm. And those processes lead to the different symptoms we see. For some people, it's trouble eating, it's gastrointestinal issues. For others, it's racing heartbeats and low blood pressures. For others, it's brain fog. So it's these pathways that spread out afterwards. And that's what makes the treatment at the end of the downstream cascade very difficult. So that's why I think the prevention part of it has to be part of the conversation. And that's why actually I like the name long COVID because it has the word COVID in it. Hmm. It mentions the fact that the infection is the precipitant for everything that happens afterwards. This is interesting though, because we're three years into this thing, more than three years into this thing, and we're still talking prevention, which seems so obvious on the face of it, but I don't know what your anecdotal evidence is. Mine is that people have moved on from that. I, I, and look, I get it. I, it. All of us want to move on. I can tell you on the front lines in hospitals, I wish this was over after the first three months and that first wave. But it hasn't moved on. There is a virus hmm. propagating. We had more people die in 2022 in Ontario than in 2020 or in 2021 from COVID. Hmm. So that was the third year of the pandemic. So it is still here. Now, it is not the same illness it was. We don't have people coming in with COVID pneumonias like we did. But this long tail of the infection causing downstream effects, I think the message still has to be an infection prevented is for the best of all of us. If for you as an individual, the best for society, the best for the healthcare system. And I think we have to talk about what an adaptive response to this looks like now. So as these waves come through, will they flood the hospitals? Maybe not, hopefully not. Could they cause long-term damage? They could. And prevention during the waves, I think, has to be part of the conversation. I'll pick up on that with Ray Watt, because as we know, and as we've discussed, long COVID can very much affect different parts of the body. Could be pulmonary, could be in the brain, can set off autoimmune issues. Does this mean down the road, when you guys get this sort of more figured out, 
we're going to need different treatments for different parts of the body that are differently affected by long COVID. I think that's likely. That's, you know, uh, that's quite likely. Um, because we're still treating tre symptoms and not treating cause. And I want to um, pick up what Dr. Ratz was talking about just now, which is preventing infection in the first place. Thank you. I think we need to have that conversation more mm -hmm. commonly. And one of the best ways of doing that is investing in appropriate public health infrastructure like clean air, uh, so, uh, strategic masking, but also new mucosal vaccines, which we've sort of uh, lost our eye on lately. Uh, mRNA vaccines sort of take up all the, all the space. But there are uh, a flotilla of new mucosal vaccines being trialed, and I hope that we have the wherewithal and the enthusiasm to adopt them in this country when they become available. They'll be able to prevent infection and transmission, um, we hope. But to answer your question, it is likely that we're looking at an entire set of new therapies that are going to have to evolve. Um, what they look like, I don't know. But what I'm hoping is that we make the investments in the research platforms to allow us to develop them. Now, I picked on uh, Dr. Frontera a moment ago for saying something I didn't understand because it didn't sound English to me, so I'm going to pick on you now, Ray Watt. You, you, describe, you used an adjective in describing a vaccine there that, again, I have not... What was that word? Um, mucosal. So intranasal vaccine, for example, a vaccine that elicits an immune response in the mucosa where you first encounter the virus. If you think of it as a bouncer at a nightclub, you know, you'd rather have the bouncer keep the troublemaker out of the nightclub rather than have to evict them once they're inside. So a mucosal vaccine could keep infection from entering your body in the first place. So a lot of work is being done on developing intranasal vaccines. India has one, for example. We don't know yet if it prevents infection and transmission. But we don't talk about that enough in mainstream media. A lot of work is being done behind the scenes on it. And I'm hoping that the enthusiasm will be rekindled to uh, develop them further. Gotcha. All right, let's move on and talk about those who are actually struggling with long COVID today and what sort of treatment options they have to ameliorate their situation. Jennifer Frontera, you want to get us started? What do you recommend? Yeah, so I can say um, I'm working with a uh, working group from the WHO um, and we're putting together some kind of consensus on on therapeutics, at least for post-COVID neurological symptoms. Um, you know, because there's, <laughs> if you look, there's very little uh, clinical trial data that's currently available for any symptom that you might imagine. So, you know, at the you know, in the interim, while people are trying to figure out both the mechanism and possible therapeutic approaches, um, we are sort of left applying our best practices depending on what you're looking at. So you might follow uh, headache guidelines if you're dealing with post-COVID headache, et cetera. And so I think that's the best we have at the moment. And I, I, understanding it's very frustrating for those who are suffering with long COVID because it's been three years, um, but it's just difficult to develop specific targeted therapies when you don't really have a handle on the mechanism yet. Mm. And so science is slower than we would like it to be. I think one risk that uh, you alluded to is there's uh, people want to move on. Um, funding mechanisms, at least in the U.S., are expiring. Um, so the, the money available to delve into this more is starting to dry up. So you know, I hope that um, the voices of people suffering from long COVID can be heard and that we can continue important work to try to identify targets and treatments. Fahad, what are you seeing in terms of accessibility to, for example, Paxlovid here in the province of Ontario for those for whom it could do some good? Yeah, I think um, access to care in general right now in Ontario, and this is Canada-wide, this is not blaming Ontario, for patients with long COVID is uh, very, very poor. So people are waiting six to 12 months at least now to get into some of our specialist clinics. There's very few of them. People are desperate. Every time I do you know, a show like yours, I do an interview, I get back to my office and there's voicemails waiting for me from patients who are desperate to see somebody. Mm. Please help me. I haven't been able to get an appointment. It's very, very difficult. And we know that these specialist clinics will not be able to provide the bulk of care that's required. So what we need is a pathway. We need clear guidance for primary care. Guidance from whom? Guidance from the government, from the Ministry for Ontario, across the provinces uh, and territories, federally as well. What can you do as a family doctor? How do you do that first round of assessment? Are there enough family doctors? We, we talked about this earlier. And then for the people who needed that referral into the specialist care networks. So there's not gonna be enough specialists for everyone, but even for now, the primary care doctor who is seeing this patient, there's not clear guidance for them. And that's really needed. Here are the tests that you do. Here's how you interpret the results. Here's when you refer. That's not clearly mapped out right now. The, the other thing I'll say is for research. So, you know, Dr. Frontera mentioned the United States. 
their investment for long COVID research eclipses what's happened in Canada proportionally. I know we're a smaller country. So they've invested over a billion dollars in the United States in long COVID related research. In Canada per capita, that would mean we should have invested about 100 to $200 million mm -hmm. at this point. We're nowhere close. It's a fraction of that. So there is a real opportunity, I think, to catch up on the clinical gaps that exist, providing that frontline care, but also the research in the background that's going to help us develop the next rounds of treatments, the diagnosis, all of the things that we need here to care for this. Just before I get Raywat on that, what do you do when you go back to the office and you clear your voicemail and you hear all these very sad stories? What do you do? I, I mean, there's not a lot I can do. So I, I, I call back whoever I can or I email back whoever I can and I, and I say, here's the clinics that I know of that are in Ontario but there is a long wait list. We're talking about six to 12 months. If you are a parent who is having trouble keeping your job because of long COVID or to having trouble caring for your kids, if you're a student who's having trouble going to school after developing long COVID, six to 12 months is a lifetime to wait in order to get mm. that treatment in place. And remember, the treatments are not miracle treatments. We're talking about symptom control to the best of our ability and often highly, highly imperfect. So there is not a great solution when you hear these stories right now. They're, they're heartbreaking, but there is not a great solution. Ray Watt, in your judgment, what do we need to do to make some progress on treatment? Well, this is a public policy show, so let's focus on what we can do in terms of public policy. We could fund research, absolutely. We could create better billing codes, absolutely. We could create uh, dedicated and better research shares. We could increase vaccine uptake. So vaccination uh, reduces the risk of long COVID by about 15%, according to some studies. And with each additional booster, it may even be better. So booster uptake in this country is quite poor. We could increase that. We can make eligibility for the bivalent vaccines wider and reduce the likelihood of becoming infected in the first place. We look into mucosal vaccines as well. We can develop long COVID clinics in urban centers so that we have the interdisciplinary uh, expertise waiting for individuals to not just get their one or two symptoms treated, but get the host of all their underlying conditions addressed as well. We can develop clinical guidelines for family doctors and other specialists to uh, assist them in how to, again, deal with these patients presenting anew with a host of new issues. So a lot of work needs to be done. Government has to take the lead on this, both provincially and federally, and has to do so in partnership with the uh, various medical colleges. Let me do a quick follow-up with you on that, just on one thing that was on that list, long COVID clinics. If, for example, the Minister of Health decided today that she wanted to create new long COVID clinics, how long would they take to set up? Oh, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> one could do a, a quick one inside a hospital in a matter of a couple of weeks, uh, pro tem, but a permanent sort of uh, system, possibly months. But I, I pull those numbers out of various ethereal orifices, so do not take them to the bank. <laughs> okay, I, I, I know we don't like too many fancy words on this show, but even I understood what you meant by that one. Uh, very good. Okay, how about in the United States? I mean, we, we just heard a second ago, Jennifer, that, that uh, the United States has really made a commitment to studying long COVID in ways that are disproportionate beyond the size of our respective populations compared to Canada. Uh, when do you think you will be able to get a handle on this issue as it relates to American patients who are suffering from it? Yeah, so um, the RECOVER initiative, which is, um, I think you, you uh, referenced to some extent, is the, the $1.15 billion appropriation from Congress to study long COVID. Um, that's a multi-pronged study across different age groups, children, adults, um, autopsy studies, electronic health record studies, et cetera. Um, and that's been going exceptionally well. And I think, at least in the adult cohort, for example, there's like 15,000 people that have been enrolled. It's a longitudinal study. Um, I think it's going to be ripe for um, actually harvesting and, and uh, that data and, and publishing it in relatively short time frame. Um, so I think that's going to be substantially helpful. There's also mechanistic components to that, that grant. And um, the NIH is also sponsoring a clinical trial which will be Paxlovid um, for long COVID. And uh, so that's on its way to being up and running. So I, I think, you know, things take longer than we would like, but we're making good progress towards um, at least exploring different therapeutics and mechanisms in the U.S. Hmm. Fahad, are you hearing stories in your circumstances where people are essentially putting together their own you know, people are on the internet and they're they're doing their own diagnosis and they're coming up with their own treatment plans now. You seeing much of that out there? Yeah, hearing about it for sure. And look, I don't blame people. So there's not 
there are not well-established treatments for this condition right now. Of course, I would say as a clinician, be safe, speak to your family doctor if you have access to one yeah. or your clinician. Um, do things that at least can be monitored and people make sure that what you're using is a safe product and trying to get a sense of with logs of symptoms, whether you're seeing some improvement over time. But look, in a vacuum, people will do desperate things. And there is clearly a vacuum right now in terms of available resources relative to the demand that's in the Canadian population and here in Ontario. And in those circumstances, you see this happen. We've seen this happen in medicine before when people don't have mm. access to care. So I, I understand why people are doing it. I'm hopeful, as Dr. Frontera mentioned, that some of these trials that are looking at Paxlovid or other medications will start to show benefit, but it's going to be a slow, painstaking process. And right now, the best we can do is to match every, every patient who has need to a clinician who can do the long, slow work of monitoring symptoms and trying to get a sense of what's working and not working. I'm going to toss you a softball question here. What's the status of the science advisory table for COVID-19 <laughs> for the province of Ontario? Uh, there is no science advisory exactly. table. Exactly. So uh, who... I mean... Uh, who needs to get this message in order to have things happen? Look, we have, um, we, we do have a strong clinical um, infrastructure in this province. And so I value the time of what we did in the science table. I hope it helped, but there are structures in place. So, you know, I don't want to pretend that there's not structures in place. Public Health Ontario, the Ministry of Health, Ontario Health, there are structures. Now, look, the, the challenge with long COVID is that it spreads its fingers over multiple areas. So it is a challenge for primary care. It's a challenge for acute-based care. It has multiple areas that it's going to draw on the system. One of the things that Zainab Tufekci said in her long piece in the New York Times is that recognizing that cancer, as an example, required the pulling together of the system in many ways. Mm -hmm. They developed the National Cancer Institute in the United States. Do we need a parallel kind of body that's looking at post-viral syndromes or post-infectious syndromes in general, of which we care a lot about long COVID right now, but obviously there's many precedents in healthcare, in human health, where infections acutely then downstream lead to all of these other side effects. So do we need something to pull all of those threads together into one institute that will connect all of these parts of the system? That is a great question. And since we have a minute left, I'm gonna give it to Ray Watt to give the answer to. What do you think? Yeah, specifically we need an institute for long COVID, but a post-viral syndrome institute is not a bad thing. In addition, I think we need to reinvest in medical school education. We don't really teach a lot of post-viral uh, issues in medical schools. So I think we're looking at a reimagining of how clinical care will have to evolve in the coming years. You know, if anybody from Public Health Ontario or Ontario Health or the Ministry of Health or any of the other numerous institutions that are sort of keeping an eye on this story, if any of them watch this show, you three have given them all a great to-do list of where to go going forward. Um, are you hopeful uh, that something's actually going to happen here? Uh, I am hopeful, uh, cautiously hopeful. Will it meet the scale of what's needed? I'm not sure. Has it hmm. started? There are investments federally that are in the works that will be announced, I think, in the coming weeks to months around investments on the research side. We've heard from the ministry in Ontario and across the provinces and territories that there are investments coming on the clinical side. Now, the details matter here. So what is the gap relative to the people who need care and the resources available? Where do we fit Canada in the research enterprise globally that's happening? Those are the important details that I think we have to answer, but I am cautiously hopeful. Jennifer Frontera, Rewat Dan Anden, Fahad Razak, thank you all so much for being on TVO tonight. We're grateful for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hockey may be Canada's game, but some really ugly stuff has come out over the past few years about hockey culture that doesn't make anyone proud. Justin Davis considered himself lucky to rise through the ranks all the way to play professionally, but after he'd finished his run in the game, he came to see it quite differently. He writes about that in his new book. It's called Conflicted Scars, An Average Player's Journey to the NHL. And Justin Davis joins us now. I know, first of all, welcome. It's great to meet you. Great to have you here. Glad to be here. The, the first thing I thought of when I saw the subtitle of your book is, you know, you are not an average player. You know that, right? Yeah, I think it's, uh, you're taught to be humble when you play. So the higher the level you get, you realize maybe you weren't as good as the other players. So you see yourself as that player and you don't recognize that you may be better than the other. You may be? Justin. You may be better than the Justin, other. you're one of the top, even though you were not Wayne Gretzky, right. you are one of the top like 0.000001 best percent best players in the world. You are. 
Yeah, and I, I guess the book's here to remind me of that, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's definitely been a journey. Here is what you write in the book, and I must confess, I have read a lot of hockey books, and I have never read a line like this before. You write, the truth is, I think I hate hockey. I hated hockey at many points when I played. I hated it at the end of my career, and I think I hate it now. The game of hockey is broken. It leaves scars inside us we keep hidden, and only now am I ready to talk about it. You are how old? 44. How come only now? I think when you evaluate yourself as you get older, I think you bury a lot of things inside. And uh, as my son started to come the age that I, 16, 17, when I went through a lot of the stuff that I'd buried deep inside, I realized that uh, the reason I carry so much weight and anxiety and bouts of depression and my body hurts when I wake up is because of hockey. And uh, even though it gave me uh, the profile and, and the fame at times that it did, I hate the fact what it's done to me and where, I, where I'm going through some things I'm going through right now. Even with all of, and we will get into some of the details. I read the book. It's quite, it's shocking what you've been through. Any concerns about saying out loud what you have said out loud in this book? Oh, of course. I mean, when I wrote it, it was like, you're always taught what's said in the room stays in the room. So when I wrote the book, it was initially just to my kids and uh, so that they knew who their dad was in case uh, memory issues kept popping up along the way. And you got three kids, two teenagers and one who's almost a teenager. Yep, you got it. And uh, so it was just kind of a story to them that I thought nobody would see. And in 15 years, maybe we pull it out of the drawer and I give it to them. And uh, uh, so, of course, there's a fear as soon as someone says, we're going to publish this and people are going to read about your life. I'm a teacher. So when I walk down the <laughs> hall, uh, kids I teach know some of the kind of the horrors kind of or things that I grew up with and some of the things that I've done. But uh, uh, the feedback's been fantastic. And teammates has always been supporting and, uh, and have had a great avenue just to talk. I had a lot of teachers back in the day. I don't remember any who were 6'4", 2... How much you weigh? Well, we'll say 220. We'll be generous. 6'4", 220. But anyway, there are... I mean, let's face it, there are a lot of people who have experienced in the game what you experienced. Um, not just the bullying, not just the hazing, not just the, uh, the difficulties dealing with coaches, uh, not just the sort of, it didn't work out, you know, some things the way you'd hoped. But they don't say out loud they hate hockey. Why do you think your experience might be different from theirs? I think I just hit a point where I'm just comfortable with who I am. Um, I got together last Friday night for, for wings with a couple of former teammates and we had no problem sitting around the room talking about some great stories and things that happened. And the book's been a great uh, avenue for us to, to talk about the bad things that happened. So now we're talking about that behind closed doors and, and uh, it's opened up some eyes of what happened to us. So I think it's been good that way and people are just starting to talk. But I think we're all afraid to expose things. And uh, I mean, I said I'm 44 years old and I talk about a coach in the book and, uh, and I got a phone call from him wanting to talk about some things that had been written. And is this is one of the coaches you named or didn't name? I didn't name, but I mean, I sat there as a 44 year old, three kids and a teacher and I was afraid to take the phone call hmm. because I still kind of had that fear inside me. So when we talk about why, do we, why we don't talk, I think we're still under, uh, feel like we're under control of some of these people and it's only now that, that we're starting to feel comfortable with ourselves. Well, let's go back and tell a bit of the story and then people will get a better understanding of why your feelings about hockey are so mixed these days. You were, it started I guess in Flamborough. Yes. You, were a, you were a phenomenal hockey player. You were scoring 200 plus points in seasons with 50 games. I mean, it was crazy racking up scoring records amazingly and yet you said everybody hated you why did they hate you uh, times were different back then where small town people played hockey in small towns our parents didn't drive us uh, 100 kilometers to a practice and didn't have nhl dreams when we were five or six so uh where i might now be playing triple a hockey i was playing single a hockey and in and, and scoring and scoring and scoring and I think parents are always jealous that either their son isn't doing the same things or that you're selfish and they want to bring you down to their level. So Parents on the other teams? My own team and other teams. I remember I talk in the book about uh, even at the age of five or six, walking out of the arena with my head down or going out back doors or winning an MVP of a game and putting it in my bag and just trying to walk out to the car and meeting my parents there just because uh, you're embarrassed or you just don't want to interact with people in the lobby. and. 
then I thought that was normal. And looking back, like I said, my own kid coming out of the arena, you just realize how naive you were to everything. And, uh, and it is a huge chapter in my life on uh, things I'm dealing with even to this day. When you're a five-year-old kid and you look up in the stands and you see a hockey mom giving you two birds <laughs> and frothing at the mouth, swearing at you, what goes through your mind? Well, I think you're just wondering, first, what's wrong with the person and why are they so <laughs> angry? But, I mean, you go to... You go to sporting events now and you still go to minor hockey and there's some people that have lost a lot of perspective on, uh, on the game and, and why their kid is there. How much of the fact, how much of the broken aspects of hockey today would you lay at the feet of parents who just really don't understand that this is supposed to be a fun game for kids? Yeah, I think, I mean, the majority of it. And I think the majority of these people are people who have never played the game, have never played the game at a high level. So they feel like their coach or their parents didn't put enough money in and their kid's gonna be the next one. And, and the more money they put in, the more time and the more pressure they put on, they're gonna become Connor McDavid. But these are generational players. And I talk all the time about uh, the best part of hockey should be driving in the car with your kids and stopping for a milkshake or a burger after the game or having conversations that you, know, you normally don't have. I mean, I have a 17 year old son. If it wasn't for sports, I wouldn't spend 10 hours a week with them in the car, but that's something that we have. And um, if they make it, they make it. But if not, I mean, it's a relationship you get to have with your kids. I remember Brendan Shanahan once telling the story about how when his dad dropped him off at games, his dad would sit up in the very top row and read the paper during the games. And Brendan, I think at the time, thought, why isn't he interested? And then with the benefit of hindsight, realized, actually, that was exactly the right approach to take. Make sense? Yeah, and I said in the foreword of the book, like, I apologize that I'm the guy sitting by myself all the time, and, <laughs> but I just want to watch them play, and I don't want to get caught up in the other stuff. And I laughed. My dad, when I played junior hockey, he used to stand in the same spot, and he stood by himself, but I knew if I wasn't playing well and I looked up in the second period, sometimes he'd be gone. <laughs> and uh, I remember him telling me that I knew if he didn't have a good first couple of periods, it wasn't worth staying for the third period. So <laughs> he meant well, but uh, there's obviously a different side, too. Let's talk hazing. Yeah. Uh, a real curtain has been pulled back on the whole hazing thing. These initiations that uh, a lot of teams put their, I guess, particularly rookies through. For those who don't follow this stuff, give us an example of some of the crap you went through. Well, I think from early ages, I played junior C, junior B, junior A, and OHL hockey. So each year I got initiated. Uh, everything was from the basics of getting your head shaved, your entire body being shaved. Um, it seemed that when you're looking back on it, everything involved nudity or um, walking around naked or different things happening. And I think the one component most people talk about is a hot box that used to happen in uh, major junior hockey where uh, all the rookies would strip down at the same time, walk to the back of the bus, and they'd stand in uh, the bus bathroom with the heat on. And uh, they'd go 10, 20, 30 minutes to hour to two hours in the bus bathroom. And uh, when there's a knock on the door, you could come out. So. Uh, stuff like that was cyclical and you didn't realize it, it was a badge of honor you thought that everybody did that but looking back on it you realize just <laughs> how crazy that was. Looking back on it, I mean I guess the idea behind it was that it's it's one of these teams that everybody participates, one of these things everybody participates in and it builds team spirit. Did it ever do that in your experience? No, I think if anything it, it might have made you feel closer to the guys that were in the bathroom with you, but and you thought it was this badge of honor, but looking back, I mean, there's other things that could have happened that uh, would have provided the same avenue. And my son plays baseball for one of the the top uh, baseball team in the province, the Great Lake Canadians out of London. And I drop him off as a 17 year old, and I don't think of him being bullied or being in a bus bathroom or being hazed. And these are eight coaches that teach character and integrity. And so then I look back on that and think, why would I be afraid to drop them off at a hockey game? Or why were these things happening to me? And you realize hockey is just its own sport and it's these traditions that have been passed on. No 17 year old thinks to themselves, we should stick six people in the bathroom or we should make them run around naked. These are just things that have been passed on uh, through decades. Is hazing out of the game now to the best of your knowledge? I would say at the higher levels, the CHL has really tried to take out the, the terrible uh, aspects of it, but in the Alberta Junior Hockey League this past year, uh, a captain and assistant were suspended for 14 games for uh, hazing stuff going on. And that's what I worry about the lower levels of things, double A hockey, triple A hockey, junior C, junior B. And 
uh, I think it's still going on, and, and these are, are things that people say, well, you hate hockey, why are you talking about this? I just want kids to play hockey and enjoy it mm. and be protected. I love the game, certain aspects of the game, but it, it should be safe for people to come and play. I'm going to share some numbers with you and our viewers here. In 2021, surveys found that 41% of families in all the major junior hockey leagues in Canada, CHL, say there's a problem with harassment in the game, 41% compared to 19% of general managers feeling the same way. Two more numbers. 24% of those surveyed said there's a problem with discrimination in the game. 24. Only 16% of general managers thought there was. That's a reality gap. Why does that gap exist? Well, I think it's, it's easy for the people involved to say that there's an issue. But when you're in control of the game, like we have People that run teams that are the coaches and general managers of a team. So if you have an issue, you report it to the coach. Well, sometimes that coach is the general manager and everybody's tied in. So it's easy for them to say there isn't a problem because as a player, I never really felt comfortable going to my coach and saying, I would never say, oh, so-and-so bullied me or this was happening because they say uh, we would trade you. So I think that's the issue. And that's the issue that you see in those statistics. And a lot of that's from the Turnpenny report that was released in 2018. And the CHL tried to bury that report. And they would only report about things that happened from uh, after 2016 or 2018 when they did the report. Mm -hmm. So we're not even diving into 2010, 2012, or 2003, or way back. So these are, these are current numbers, and those numbers are even protected. Turnpenny is Rachel Turnpenny, who's a yeah. Toronto lawyer who gets called in to investigate some of these situations from mm -hmm. time to time. Let's talk a bit about, uh, okay, your junior career, Kingston Frontenacs, Ontario Hockey League. Great team, great league. A lot of, not a lot, but a certain percentage of folks from that uh, league go on to play in the National Hockey League. You got drafted in 1996 by the Washington Capitals. 85th pick, what was that, third round? Uh, I think it was fourth round then. Fourth yeah. round? Yeah. yeah. Sedano Charo was in the third round. Yeah. So same year as the Big Z. You looked like you were on your way to the NHL. What happened to make it take a turn for the worse? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, sometimes you show up and you realize maybe you're not good enough and you see other players and uh, playing in the Canadian Hockey League, you think it's a be-all, end-all, but then you show up to training camp and there's uh, people from Finland and Sweden and players you never heard of that were, that were really good, but... For me, my problem was I, uh, I had a major concussion the year before, the year after the, the draft, and uh, I had a minor scrape of the law that was uh, uh, something that never should have happened, but it happened. And it seems like anything that bad that could have happened happened the year after uh, I got drafted and uh, uh, was not something you'd want after being picked. Okay, the minor scrape of the law was kind <laughs> of, a, it's actually a very funny story. It's in the book. I won't ruin it for those who want to buy the book. Uh, but, but the concussion is serious business. Tell us how that concussion happened and how the team you played for at the time handled it. Uh, we were playing game, I was playing for the Sault Ste. Marie Greyhounds and uh, we were playing in Detroit. I took a, a late hit against the boards and uh, I was unconscious on the ice and I had a fencing response. So if anyone watched Miami Dolphins uh, game last year, their quarterback, it's where your hands kind of go stiff. And uh, I was unconscious for two or three minutes on the ice. I was taken to the training room where I came to and then I was put on the bus. Uh, on the bus, I was throwing up everywhere and, uh, and in and out of consciousness. And they were trying to sneak me across to Canada because they didn't want to pay the U.S. medical bills. And uh, the trainer finally, uh, the last time I threw up, said we need to get him to the hospital. And they dropped me off to the hospital. And I got a CT scan. I had major bleeding on the brain, was rushed to uh, intensive care. And I was left there by myself in intensive care. And the bus continued home to Sault Ste. Marie. And my mom ended up driving uh, that night to join me and uh, after the fact after I was in there for three or four days and returned home uh, I was given the bill uh, given the bill for the CT scans and the care in the US and was told that uh, my contract in the OHL did not cover uh, US medical expenses was it 17 grand the bill yeah 17 grand and uh, and my parents contacted my agent, Alan Walsh, who's a well-known agent that takes care of his players, and he told them that that's fine, we'll pay the bill, but uh, we'll let everybody know how you take care of your players. I mean, that's shocking, isn't it? Yeah, and I think at the time, you're, you talked earlier about are you afraid to speak up. I think even at the time, I, 
was afraid for my parents to speak up and I wanted them to pay the $16,000 because mm. I didn't want to lose my spot in the team and be the guy that's a problem in the dressing room. But looking back on it now, I mean, they promise all these things and then here's someone that won't even take care of your medical bills. <laughs> In your third year in the Ontario Hockey League, you're playing for the Sioux, you got a new coach, and you write, if I had to choose one coach not to emulate in any way, it would be him. You want to name him? No, I don't think I'm comfortable naming him right now, but I will say that uh, we've talked this past year, and he's reached out and he's opened, I think, my eyes to some things that were going on behind the scenes with the general manager. And uh, the general manager at the time, uh, Dave Mayville, wasn't was I feel like was the root of a lot of that was going on and hmm. he was a newer coach that things happened with him and he's apologized and I think to have the this many years later to reach out and being a high profile coach I'm actually happy he did that but uh, realizing now there's some things behind the scenes and things that I wished weren't true were actually true in the way that I was treated and uh, and uh, you just wish some people would be called to task for some of the things that they did. One of the things I was happy to read about in the book is that the greatest junior coach of all time, <laughs> Brian Killer Kilray, actually knew of you when you were in the Sioux, decided to trade for you because he said, I think I can turn him into something. He always played well against us. Yeah. I think I can turn him into something. And, and it worked out. You had a great run with Killer Kilray's Ottawa 67s. What made it great? It was the first time you were treated as a human being. So I remember when he traded for me, he waited for me in the dressing room and said, you're coming back with me. And uh, I lived at his house with him for, for two or three days. And uh, although he's this boisterous, loud guy, if you made a mistake, um, he'd yell at you from across the ice and he'd take that sneaky like little path so the fans couldn't really see and try and sneak in the bench. But after the game, when you thought he hated you or that you made the worst mistake ever, he'd ask how your parents were doing. and. He'd say, uh, here's some gas money for the way home, and he'd actually ask how you're doing. So it was the first time, it seemed simple, where he treated me as a human being, and he let us play. We were in the same practice every day for two years, but it was high-paced, and it was just creativity was, um, was expected, and uh, he let us play hockey. What's the story about him saying to one of his players, if I beat you out on the ice, all these guys are going to have... Go ahead, you know the one I'm referring to. Yeah, I mean, his best line is, my favorite line is, he'd look at you and say, uh, uh, Davis, I don't know if you're playing right wing for us or left wing for them. <laughs> that used to be, uh, and I still use that coaching now. But uh, yeah, we were, one of the guys was late for practice one day, and I remember uh, Ryan Kilroy, probably 65 years old, 70 years old at the time, said, if, uh, if I beat you out on the ice before you get dressed, then the whole team's skating. And I just remember him going into his office and, uh, and coming out about... 20 seconds later with just a hat and a whistle and his skates on his gloves saying, I beat you, we're skating, and just that little chuckle that he'd have. And uh, he was just such a funny guy and it felt like you're being coached by your grandfather. Hat, gloves, stick, whistle, skates, and nothing else. No, just Brian Kilray. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, all right, let's do this. We started with a quote about you um, really not liking hockey, hating hockey. But then through playing for Killer Kilray, and then after that you went to the University of Western Ontario, as it then was, now Western University. You won a Memorial Cup with Kilray. You won a university championship at Western. Did all of that rekindle some love of the game for you? Yeah, for sure. I remember that. Um, I remember that last year in Ottawa when we won the Memorial Cup. I just remember I had the opportunity to assist on the game-winning goal, and I just remember walking to a bathroom stall in the dressing room and just sitting there by myself in my equipment and just kind of tears flowing just I mean you have the joy of winning but it was just seeing all the things that you'd been through and just that joy of playing hockey again was brought back and uh, and then that led me going to Western I realized uh, where I was in the hockey world and uh, I could play professionally after but if I got my education and did that and surrounded by Clark Singer and just a great program at Western it I left there and I just realized why I why I love the game and the whole book is there's a love hate relationship with it now you, you you sort of threw that away there you assisted on the Memorial Cup winning goal in triple overtime that one was uh, it was the first overtime first overtime and then at Western we won in triple overtime okay so you had some pretty dramatic exciting yeah. moments there yeah and I see you're smiling, so you still love them. Well, those are the good moments. When people say, do you hate hockey? I, I love those moments, and those teammates are 
are some of my best friends and moments I'll never forget. You also talked in the book about how you got that scar on your upper lip, and I must confess, when you described it in the book, I thought, that's pretty gross, but I'm sure you got a good plastic surgeon, and it, you know, <laughs> you probably can't even see it anymore. I got news for you, Justin. I can see it. <laughs> you, you've got a good souvenir from your playing tapes there, right? Oh, don't tell my mom. My mom's been on me for about 20 years to get that fixed, but uh, the book's called Conflicted Scars, and that's one of the outward scars that uh, is a part of me. You've got a quote in here from Jamie McLennan, uh, who's TSN, formerly a, a goalie, who said, hockey is 95% amazing, but the 5%, there are serious issues there, and they have to be dealt with. What's the biggest obstacle to getting that 5% that's a problem dealt with? I think it's diversity in the game. I think it's, you look at coaching, it's the same coaches that get recycled. It's the same general managers that get recycled. People get fired, people get hired. And it's the same way of thinking. Um, there's, uh, there's females getting hired now in, in front offices and in coaching staffs, and, which is great. It, it's a different aspect for people. People that didn't play the hockey, didn't play hockey at a high level that understand the game and understand different numbers. And that's, that's a huge change for it. And then they can look from the outside. I remember telling stories in my uh, staff room, I'm a teacher, and uh, telling stories to some of the people that I work with and them just looking at me and thinking that's the craziest thing they've ever heard. But in a hockey room and the people I hang out with, those are normal stories. So I think when I say diversity and different uh, voices, uh, I think that changes things so people don't realize the things that we view as being normal. Um, they realize that they're very abnormal. Uh, the, the book was a, a terrific read, and you've got some really important things to say in there, so I'm glad you said them. Conflicted Scars, An Average Player's Journey to the NHL, Justin Davis. Thanks, Justin. Perfect. Thank you. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, February 28th, 2023. Tomorrow, we'll welcome back film critic and former Saturday Night at the Movies host, Tom Ernst, to talk about his wonderful but devastating new memoir. Also, we'll do a deep dive on competition policy and ask whether monopolies are killing small town Canada. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pagan is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.